Hi, my name is Andrew Boyle. I'm the Firearms Reference Manager here at Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology, and today we're going to go through the Firearms 101 presentation. The presentation is about the basics of firearms identification that are specifically related to the terminology you use while acquiring bullets and cartridge cases in IBIS Tracks HD3D. So together we're going to cover the following topics. We're going to talk about the unfired cartridge, then we're going to talk about parts of the firearm, then we're going to get into the markings that are left on fired cartridge cases, and finally the markings on fired bullets. So here we go with the unfired cartridge. There have been many different designs of cartridges throughout the years, but the two that have really stood the test of time and that are commonly encountered nowadays, and the ones that we cover with IBIS, are the uh, center fire type, and that's where the primer is located in the center of the head of the cartridge case. And there's the rim fire type, where the primer is actually 360 degrees around that perimeter inside the rim of the cartridge case. If we take a closer look at the center fire, uh, we'll see that there are four main components here to a center fire cartridge. There's the cartridge case, there's the bullet, inside you've got the propellant, and at the rear you've got the primer. Also, uh, different parts, uh, naming them, you've got the head of the cartridge is where the primer side. This is a top view of the head right over here. On the opposite end, you've got the mouth. That's where the bullet is actually inserted. You've got a cantilever on this bullet. Uh, that's not always there, but this particular one does have it. And this cantilever here is a band uh, going all the way around the bullet circumference, which is there to give the uh, mouth of the cartridge case a little bit more grip when it's crimped around it at the factory when the ammunition is being made. At the back, you've got the extractor groove. Uh, this is a groove around the base where uh, it facilitates the extractor, which is almost like a claw or a hook that's part of the firearm that's going to grip onto the back of the cartridge case. And that groove is there to give it a little bit more purchase when it grabs on. If you talk about rim fires, you've got the same four components here, the cartridge case, the bullet, propellant on the inside, but then you'll see the primer is a little different. The primer is actually inside, and just like we saw earlier, it is all the way around. It's 306 degrees around that inside of the rim. And you've got the cartridge head at the back, mouth at the front, just like before. Here you've got a cantilever on the side. The well, first one is knurled. The second cantilever here is smooth, and it is filled with a lubricant. The reason why you have these on the lead bullet, uh, they help break up the bearing surface. The bearing surface is the part of the bullet that is going to have contact with the barrel. And lead is a very soft metal that, uh, as it goes down the barrel, it kind of smears along. It, uh, it is a, a dirty metal to work with, essentially. And ultimately, as it goes down that barrel, it's going to leave a residue. And so having those cantilevers there, they break up the bearing surface, give it a little less friction to make it slide easier, and even introducing lubricant as well helps it slide that much better also. And at that tail, you've got the rim as well. Of course, that's where the primer is. There's your rim. Now, if we talk about rims, there are different types that you're going to see on different types of cartridges. A rimmed cartridge, just like that rim fire, is a cartridge that has a rim that flares out wider than the diameter of the body of the cartridge case. So the diameter of the rim is wider than the body of the diameter of the cartridge case. Semi-rimmed is similar. It's wider at the, at the rim, but also you've got an extractor groove. A rimless cartridge simply has a rim diameter that's equal to the diameter of the cartridge body. And a belted one has a reinforced band towards the back of the cartridge case here. And the reason why that's there is that this is going to be a very high pressure round, uh, rifle round. And because of the pressures that are introduced, if we look inside this guy, the part of the cartridge case here where the wall comes down and meets to the base, this corner is called the web. And when you have extremely high pressures, that web is a high stress spot that can tear apart inside. And so a belted cartridge has that reinforced band there to just make sure that web is reinforced and stronger. Lastly, you've got a rebated rim here, and you'd come across this. The rim diameter is actually narrower than the body of the cartridge case. You'll see this when a cartridge was designed uh, to reuse an existing part, a gun part that was already out there. What that means is that 
when you have a caliber like this, the diameter of the body and the bullet that's going to fire require a new barrel, a new chamber, usually one piece. But when it comes time for the rim where the bolt of the firearm is going to interact, rather than design a brand new bolt, you can reuse an existing one if you just make the diameter of that rim equal to an existing caliber. So that's what they did. They made it much bigger in the front, but then they tapered it down smaller at the back so that they could reuse a bolt face that already exists. To understand cartridge names, uh, two big things to keep in mind is that there are no rules to how you name a cartridge. And if you're the one who invented it, you can call it what you like. So you factor that in around the world, you've got different people at different times that were coming up with different ideas. And at times you can see that there are trends that were followed, but overall, uh, car naming cartridges can be a pretty wild thing. The first portion of the cartridge name generally refers to the bullet's diameter, but that does not necessarily represent its true diameter. And what I mean by that is a caliber, a common caliber, like 38 Special here, the proper name of that caliber is 38 Special, just like you see it here. There's no decimal point, you'll notice. 38 Special is the name of that caliber, but the bullet diameter is actually 0.357 of an inch. Uh, that's essentially point 36 specials, but they could have called it, but they did not. It's 38 special is the proper name. But the fact that they didn't, that you do not include the decimal point there in the caliber name is a rule that should be followed. Uh, the decimal point is there for the true diameter, but when you're using a name, uh, it does not need to be included for the uh, imperial measurement. The inches calibers uh, don't have to have that one. Second portion of the name could refer to any number of things, which include the following. Uh, you could have the designer's name, which is a person or company. 308 Winchester is an example of that. Winchester Company designed the cartridge. It might also refer to the cartridge case length. So you have a caliber name like this is typically uh, from a military caliber. Uh, the first portion is the bullet diameter, 7.62 times the cartridge case length, 39 millimeters. Year location of introduction, so it, you could have 30 odd six Springfield, 30 caliber bullet introduced in 1906 at the Army's Springfield Armory. Could also refer to the powder charge. This was common back in the 18, well, mid 1800s. Uh, 4440 Winchester was a 44 caliber bullet with 40 grains of black powder made by Winchester. Or it could just be something that the designer thought sounded cool. An example of that could be 577 Tyrannosaur. That's a cool sounding caliber. Uh, and that was just what they wanted to call it. Cartridges can be known by different caliber names around uh, the world, depending on where you are. And an example of that could be 9mm Parabellum here. That was what it was originally called as it was designed by the Germans around the 1890s or so. Uh, in, during World War I, it was commonly encountered in the Luger pistol, and the Americans just nicknamed it 9mm Luger, and over time, that name stuck. And the military version of this, it is still a military caliber, and it has a military standard naming. Uh, 9x19 is 9mm bullet, 19mm length cartridge case. These are all synonyms for talking about the exact same caliber. And one last thing is if you see Magnum as part of the name, 44 Magnum or 357 Magnum, Magnum as part of the title of the caliber is going to let you know that there's going to be a lot of pressure to this one. Expect a lot of recoil. This one's going to kick a bit. Common cartridge synonyms. Well, these are some popular examples of cartridges that have uh, many, uh, multiple names. And depending on where you are in the world, one might be more commonly encountered than, that, than another. Uh, 25 Automatic Colt Pistol is the full proper name of this caliber, but it's been shortened down to 25 ACP, 25 Auto, and in Europe, uh, with the metric system, you'd see this stamp on the side of the gun, 6.35 by 17 millimeters. 32 Automatic Colt Pistol goes through the similar naming process, 32 ACP, 32 Auto, 7.65 by 17 millimeters. 380 Auto has got a bit more names to it. Uh, 380 Automatic Colt Pistol, 380 ACP, 380 Auto, 9x17, 9mm Browning, and then 9mm Short or 9mm Kurs is short in German. 9mm Corto is short in Italian and Spanish. And 9mm Browning Cool is French uh, for short also. So 
you've got uh, this caliber known in different countries by different names, but again, these are all talking about the exact same caliber. 45 automatic Colt pistol, 45 ACP, 45 auto, 11.25 by 23. 9 millimeter Makarov, 9 Mac, 9 by 18 millimeter. We saw this 9 millimeter Parabellum before. 9 Luger, 9 by 19, could even be called 9 millimeter NATO. 40 Smith and Wesson, 40 S and W, 40 Auto, 10 by 22 millimeter. 10 millimeter Auto, uh, automatic. Sorry, 10 millimeter Auto, uh, 10 by 25. There's a lot of these to remember. But what you're going to find is that you're going to become accustomed to the same ones that you see in your region. Wherever you are in the world doing your work on the IBIS machine, what you're probably going to notice is that after a while, you're really seeing probably about the same eight calibers or so over and over again. Those are the common calibers uh, with, within street crime in your area. And so those ones you're going to get to know quite well just through exposure. So it's important to understand that there are very deliberate dimensions uh, to the components of a cartridge there. The bullet components, the cartridge case components, individually as well as when they're assembled together, the overall dimensions of these are very deliberate, very specific. And one example of that are the three 9mm that we saw previously, 9 by 17 also 380 Auto, 9 8 by 18 also 9 Makarov, 9 by 19 also 9 Parabellum. Uh, each one of these guys, even though they're all 9mm across, in their diameter, their overall shape is quite different. And when you have nine millimeter Makarov, you don't want to have this bullet on top of it. It is going to take this bullet with these dimensions. Um, that also holds true for some other ones here. Uh, 7.62 by 25, 7.62 by 39, 7.62 by 54R. They all have a similar sounding bullet, but the bullet shape is quite different for each one. And the short range bullet that's used in pistols or submachine guns didn't have to have an extreme range to it. And so it's, it's aerodynamic enough for short range, but not for reaching out very, very far. 760 by 39 is a mid range caliber. 760 by 54R is a longer range caliber. And you see the bullet's going to be a bit longer, a bit heavier. And even inside here, if you can see it, it's going to be a bit more aerodynamic as well. So just because they start with the same name does not mean the parts are interchangeable. There's going to be something very deliberate about each one of these uh, calibers. Shot shells are a little different. Uh, the main body here in red uh, would be plastic as far as this drawing goes. Uh, that is your case. At the bottom, you've got the metallic portion, which is the base. You could have some where the case itself is metallic as well. The, the metal base might extend all the way up. Uh, that case may sometimes even be cardboard too, depending on uh, how old the cartridge is or, or what brand it is. There's a rim at the bottom. Once we look inside, you can see at the very top, you've got the crimp here where the plastic was folded over to contain the, the payload inside. And that payload in this case is called shot. These are little pellets, usually lead or steel. And the shot itself can vary greatly depending on what it is that you are wanting to shoot at. Uh, so you have bird shot and buck shot. Bird shot for bird hunting, buck shot for deer hunting. And when you have that, the shot is, is also graded by numbers, which indicate the size to it. And depending on what range you expect to be firing at or the size of the bird or, or, uh, or deer, you can have uh, number four sh bird shot, number eight bird shot, which would have different size pellets, good for different ranges, and uh, buckshot as well, uh, double lot buckshot, triple lot buckshot. The bigger the pellets are, the fewer there are, but the more, uh, more power they're going to have as they fly down range. The lighter, smaller ones are going to lose their energy sooner, but depending on how far away the target is, that's maybe not a concern. And when you do hit the bird that you're trying to hunt, uh, you don't want it to get pulverized. You're ideally trying to hunt this for, for its meat, and uh, using the right shot is going to give you the best results for that. Uh, what's great about shotguns is their versatility. From that same single shotgun, you can change up what you do by changing the actual round that you work with. And so you can hunt uh, birds in the morning and, and beat deer in the afternoon, and all you have to do is change the round in your barrel. The wad is the cup that is containing the shot, and propellant that sits underneath it. 
you've got a base wad here which is uh, at the at the bottom and between the base wad and the base is pinching the actual case the primer is at the rear for center fire like you see and the primer is in something called the battery cup for shot shells which is a unit that's assembled and then inserted into the base itself an important note for shotguns is that wad, that plastic wad, is a buffer between the shot and the barrel. And the shot itself, you could even have one giant, uh, one giant projectile, in which case it would be called a slug for shotguns. And even when it's a slug that you're firing, there is always a wad, and that wad is always a buffer between the projectile and the barrel. So as far as bullet tracks goes, there's not much for... Uh, the bullet track system to work with here. However, with brass tracks, the cartridge case portion, everything that we're interested in is still happening on these shot shells. There's no reason you can't do a shot shell in brass tracks. So let's get into the firearm components now. There's many types of firearms around the world, but what we are concerned with when we're talking about IBIS tracks HD3D is the small arms, which are uh, guns that are easily carried and fired by an individual. This is the type of stuff that you're going to see in your street crime. For our purposes, we're going to break down these small arms into two families. Handguns, which are just handheld, and those would be like pistols and revolvers. Long guns are shoulder supported there. They take both arms to, uh, to hold, and you're going to want to prop that up against your shoulder to fire, or at least they're intended to. Rifles, shotguns, some machine guns, machine guns. Wherever you are, you're going to have some local or, uh, or even national laws about what the definition of a handgun is, what a long gun is. You should familiarize yourself with what your local laws are, whether it's your state or provincial law or national federal laws. Uh, the definitions of what falls under what category could vary from place to place. So you, it's up to you to know what it is for your own uh, location. Main parts of the pistol, we've got the frame at the bottom, uh, the slide in black up at the top. Uh, in blue, we've got the barrel. In green, we've got the guide rod and recoil spring. Now, on the barrel, you've got the chamber. That's where the cartridge is going to rest uh, as it's waiting to be fired. The ejector is part of the frame, and that is a fixed plunger, essentially, uh, in this case, anyway. And the ejector is what strikes the cartridge case to eject it out of the open window of the firearm, the ejection port. Up on the slide, you've got the extractor, which is that hook or claw that we talked about earlier. You've got the breech face on the front of that slide, in the, uh, which would be at, at the rear of the chamber. That's ultimately going to support the back edge of the chamber. And so that cartridge is going to go in the chamber here. And as these parts all come together, it's going to assemble the firearm for us. There we go. So that's the gun ready to fire, essentially. When we take a closer look at that, see it transparent, what happens during the firing sequence, when the trigger is pulled, ultimately that firing pin is going to strike the primer at the back of the cartridge case. When that primer gets struck, it's going to get crushed, and there's a chemical compound inside that, under that, those circumstances, is going to cause a spark to go through the flash hole at the back of the cartridge case and ignite the propellant. Once that powder burns, pressure rapidly builds up, and all of those expanding gases, all that pressure building is always going to leave by the path of least resistance. So the gun itself is designed to make that path of least resistance be to channel that uh, pressure and push that bullet down the barrel. The chamber itself is reinforcing the cartridge case all the way around it, and so all those gases uh, that first make that cartridge case balloon out that loosens the grip of the mouth of the cartridge case around the bullet, and then that bullet now goes down range. The equal and opposite reaction to the, all that pressure pushing the bullet is that it's also going to be pushing the cartridge case. But that cartridge case has the breech face wall here up against it, and so as it pushes against that, it's got to build up enough energy to overcome the weight of the slide and the spring tension of the uh, guide rod spring, recoil spring. And so as it does that, that bullet is already moving. And for this particular design of gun, this one operates off of the recoil principle with a tilting barrel. And what that means is the design of this gun's got to gain a couple fractions of a second to not open up this window here. You do not want the slide 
uh, ejection port window, you don't want the slide to move back and open the ejection port window until that bullet has left the muzzle. Because all those pressures that are going to leave by the path of least resistance, if that path of least, if a new path opens up here by an open window, you'll get that fireball coming out the side of the gun instead of pushing the bullet out the front. So for a recoil designed pistol, they will have the barrel recoil backwards with the slide for a short distance. And that distance is measured right here, where you've got this fixed ramp uh, molded into the chamber here that is going to interact with this fixed ramp that's part of the frame. So they move together for this short distance with just enough time for that bullet and fireball to leave by the front, by the muzzle. And then as these two interact, it's going to drop that uh, chamber down and unlock it from the uh, slide. That slide, all that pressure from the cartridge case is going to continue to push that slide back. Uh, but ultimately the uh, barrel and chamber is are going to stop in that tilted down position. And we can see that right now. So as that came back, that unlocked the chamber, dropped it down. That cartridge case, because it was gripped by the extractor groove, by that hook over here from the top view, it was holding on to it. It made sure the cartridge case got pulled out of the chamber. And as it was getting pulled back, ultimately the ejector punched its nose out of the uh, bottom of the breech wall, breech face wall. And as it struck the cartridge case on the left-hand side, the fact that it was getting pulled by the right-hand side directs it out uh, the ejection port window just the way they wanted it to. Once that's done, the magazine here would push up the next round uh, in sequence from the magazine. And as this recoil spring expands again and the slide closes, it will catch the top of that next cartridge and the nose of that bullet will go up this ramp here and seat in the uh, chamber waiting to be fired next uh, for the next shot. So that's a little preview of what happens inside the gun as it's being fired. And so let's talk about the markings now that that leaves on the cartridge case. So we want to concentrate on what's taking place at the breech face here on the face of the slide. That from the front view is going to look a little something like this. And the different components we have here, uh, the firing pin aperture is the hole in that wall where the firing pin is going to stick its nose out. And as it sticks that nose out, that's when it strikes the primer on the back of the cartridge case. Your ejector aperture is a little slot here as well. That as the slide goes back, we saw it. Eventually, the nose of that ejector is going to poke out through here, striking the edge, the back edge of the cartridge case to kick the empty round out the ejection port. The extractor is that hook up here. This is a front view of it. It would be gripping onto the side of that cartridge case right in the extractor groove. And on the breech face itself, you've got the machining marks from when it was being made, the uh, cutting tools that were cutting and shaping that block of steel to make it into the dimensions of the actual slide. As that cutting tool is, is dragging across the surface here, it is leaving a microscopic pattern across that surface. And you got to factor in that metal, cutting metal, that surface is not just peeling up, like uh, pulling off an, uh, a strip of a banana peel the metal itself is chipping and flaking as that blade is dragging, dragging across it. And all of that introduces little random areas that are going to be contributing to the fact that this is a unique pattern for this particular gun. And the next one in line in the manufacturing process microscopically is going to have that little, those random little chips happening in their own uh, unique pattern as well. So the transferring of marks takes place during the firing sequence. Got your cartridge case that's resting up against the wall, or almost in this case here. All that pressure that was pushing that bullet down the barrel is also pushing that cartridge case back up against the breech face. And so when that strikes the breech face, that harder surface, when these two surfaces interact, the harder surface, which is the surface of the slide, is going to transfer its marks onto the softer surface, which is the surface of the primer. And so after that takes place, you've got on that primer the negative impression of what was on that breech face. So a peak here becomes a valley over here. A valley over here becomes a peak on this side. And that is essentially a, a stamped pattern across that cartridge case uh, from it get all that pressure pushing it right up against it. The patterns that are on that breech face can vary depending on the manufacturing process. 
So for parallel lines, that was a cutting tool that was going in one direction being swept across the surface. For arches and concentric circles, what both of these have in common is that the cutting tool was spinning. And in this case, it was a spinning tool that was pressed against the surface and then slid across. Whereas concentric circles, it's a spinning tool that is simply pressed against the surface. Crosshatched is when you've got a crisscross pattern. And you'll see that a lot of times when you've got a firearm that had a, a breech block that was made separate from the slide and then inserted at the factory. So the slide had, a, had an empty cavity at the back, the breech block was manufactured, inserted in that empty cavity and then pinned in place. And what happens then a lot of times is someone with a file is going to take a hand file and shave around the edges to make sure that it is a flush fit. And all of those file patterns there that are kind of crisscross in nature are going to be left on that surface and get stamped across onto whatever cartridge it, fi it fires later on. Granular surface is just a random pattern, almost like a speckled sandy surface. Uh, those are pretty tough to work with on the comparison side, but uh, they are doable when you, when you do encounter them. And a smooth surface is, well, where I've seen that the most is when you've got a firearm that was designed for, say, maritime use. Uh, Mossberg is a company that makes their Model 500 shotgun in a Mariner model, which is intended to be out in a boat and out near uh, uh, salty water. And so to make all of the components uh, more resistant to that salt water, they chrome line everything. And so that breech wall may have had any one of these patterns at one point, but then once it gets covered in chrome to make it rust proof, that chrome surface, that smooth chrome surface is what's going to be having contact with the cartridge. And that's not going to leave you a lot of marks. What sometimes happens though, is that chrome over time may have some little chips and flakes and once that starts to happen, that can be giving you a good repeatable pattern uh, in that scenario. But once, when it's brand new and smooth, it's not leaving you much to work with on that breech face, unfortunately. Firing pin shapes. Uh, there's several different shapes that you can encounter out there. Uh, some are more rectangular in nature. Uh, others could be more square. These guys are, as far as the outer perimeter goes, they would be circular as far as how IBIS classifies them in brass tracks. Uh, the nose shape is not as important to us as the outer perimeter shape. When we're looking top down, straight down at that cartridge case, we want to see what the, that outer shape of the firing pin impression looks like. And all of these guys would be classified as circular. These guys down here would be elliptical. The ejector mark. Uh, strikes on the edge of the cartridge case. This is the last thing that happens as the cartridge case is getting punched out the side of the uh, firearm. And that could strike on the edge of the rim. You could have a pointed one. You could have a semicircular one. All of these are different possible uh, shapes that uh, the ejector could have as it strikes the back of the cartridge case. Uh, particularly, uh, one we need to be aware of is there are some firearm designs out there that reuse the firing pin to strike the primer a second time as an ejector. And what you want to be cautious of there is that when you're unloading a gun that does this, if you are doing it too fast and you've got a live round in there, you never pulled the trigger, you never fired it, but if you unload it too fast, that firing pin acting as an ejector may actually set off that primer while the gun's open and, and right in front of your face. So a safe way to operate unloading a firearm all the time is to remove that magazine first and then pull the slide back slowly enough that before the ejector even comes into play, gravity is going to be your friend and that cartridge is likely going to slide right down the open magazine well and uh, just fall on the table in front of you. Doing Unloading a gun slowly, deliberately like that every time is probably the safest way to do it regardless of how that ejector actually interacts. So the center fire cartridge head, what's left on there, we can see the unfired cartridge here. It's got a head stamp, FC, Federal Cartridge Company. 9 millimeter Luger is the caliber. And this is it. Before it was fired, you've got a smooth uh, primer. Once it's been fired, well, the first thing that happened was the firing pin struck the primer and caused the firing pin impression. That crushed the chemical compound inside of it. That initiated the whole firing sequence of the cartridge itself. So once the pressure builds up enough and that cartridge case 
hits that breech wall of the firearm, the breech face marks are transferred over. There's not a lot of breech face marks on this one in particular, but that happens sometimes. Another thing that could happen, uh, not all the time, but it may happen, is you could have flowback where as the primer strikes the uh, breech face surface, you've got that firing pin hole in that breech face surface. Some of the primer may flow back into that hole and kind of bulges up and balloons in. This would be a raised surface here where the surface of the primer flowed back into the firing pin aperture. You might also come across a drag mark. And when you see a drag mark, you know that a recoil type firearm was used. Uh, not just recoil, but specifically a recoil type firearm where it has that dropping chamber. Because what happened to give you that drag mark is that firing pin that struck out and, and caused the firing pin impression is still sticking out when that chamber drops down. And so the nose of that firing pin is going to give you that drag mark here uh, as that chamber dropped during the firing sequence of the gun. You might also have shear marks. Shear marks happen when the flow back flows into that firing pin aperture and then again that dropping chamber from a recoil action pistol uh, as it dropped down what was inside that firing pin aperture gets sheared off and that will give you a nice little striated pattern here. You've also got the ejector mark which struck on the edge and those are all the main marks that we'd be working with. So here's another cartridge that was fired. Winchester Western is the stamp here. 45 Auto is the caliber. And this breech face is much nicer, has much nicer markings on it. It also does have a drag mark here again. Uh, it does not appear to have any flow back. There's no bulge around the, uh, around the outside of the firing pin impression this time. But what happens is uh, orientation marks. When you do see that drag mark, what that is telling you is it's uh, showing you where 12 o'clock was uh, when the cartridge was fired. Because that chamber dropped straight down, when you pick up a cartridge case, you see a drag mark, you know exactly what orientation had 12 o'clock when that was fired. And why that's important is that understanding the cardinal points here can let you know where you should be able to find certain marks, namely the ejector. So once you know what 12 o'clock is, you can figure out quickly what 3, 6, and 9 o'clock were. And why that's important is because the ejector mark should be found between 6 and 9. There it is right here. And typically it will be found somewhere in that region here. Not all the time, though. You can have some that are just above 9 o'clock. You might have some that are down at 6. Some guns have double ejectors, and they eject straight up. And so you might have one that strikes somewhere around 7 and 5 o'clock simultaneously. Uh, Walther is a company that uh, in the early uh, 20th century, early to mid 20th century, I guess, had a lot of firearms they made that actually ejected to the left, whereas most companies eject to the right. And so the ejector would actually be found somewhere over here. Uh, but for the vast majority, these cardinal points make the most sense here. If you find your drag mark, your ejector is going to be somewhere between what is six and nine o'clock. There's also an extractor mark that can be used. If you don't have a drag mark, if it didn't happen, but you do have an extractor mark, you can find that, and that will tell you what 3 o'clock was. But in order to find it, you need to go and look on the side of the cartridge case and locate it in the extractor groove. Once you find that, that's from the, the, the nose of that hook as it sprung down and clamped on. That nose bounces off the side of the cartridge case there, and it's going to leave a little mark in the extractor groove once you've found that, you know what your 3 o'clock is, and from 3, you can find 9 and 6, and your ejector again. So these are all different ways of orientating yourself, and there are going to be rules on how some of these uh, things should be positioned during your brass tracks acquisition, but your trainer is going to go through that uh, when they're on site with you later on. Rimfire cartridge heads, there's two main classifications here for rimfires. Uh, there's a circular where it's pretty much a round impression and you could have some that are rectangular as well where it's more squared edges, uh, straight edges here. A circular one is going to take a single acquisition uh, for the 2D image where ring light is used. Uh, and then also you're going to do your high definition 3D acquisition as well on, on brass tracks. But uh, for a rectangular shaped one, there's two 2D images taken. The first is a side light shining down from three o'clock and the second is a side light shining up from six o'clock 
And one or the other typically will react well, has shadows on the surface that react well with whatever that surface pattern is. And then once we do the HD3D marks as well, uh, it's going to uh, give you a lot to work with for your uh, comparisons later on. But these are the two main styles that you can come across here. You could have some where the, uh, uh, there are multiple firing pins could happen on some uh, designs of rimfire firearms. Uh, this is a single firing pin here. What's common is that they're always going to strike around the edge because that's where that primer was, if you remember. So they're always going to crush the edge of the, of the cartridge case rim somewhere. But you could have some where you've got uh, two rectangular ones that strike simultaneously. You've all, you can also see it where there's a rectangular one on this side and another one as well on the other side. It struck twice uh, as part of the firing sequence there. Uh, you might even have one that's a big long bar that goes across the entire surface there. So it gives you one and two areas that are doubling your chances of, of making sure that primer is actually struck. Those are some different things that you could come across. When you do come across that, your trainer is going to show you, you simply acquire the first firing pin and then you acquire the second one a second time there. Those are, uh, that's what you do in those scenarios. Cartridge case class characteristics, uh, they're a little more complex than what we're going to say here just because for simplicity's sake, the class characteristics of a cartridge case that we're interested in are really just the caliber and the firing pin shape. That's how we want to tag the exhibit in brass tracks. After that, everything else is going to get figured out by the algorithms on uh, how it correlates the, uh, the information within your database. Um, so everything to do with the breech face, the firing pin, the ejector mark, during the correlation, those algorithms are, are doing the hard work, reading the patterns on that surface. As you're classifying it, the class characteristics we care about for brass tracks are really just the caliber and the firing pin shape. So the caliber name here is, is pretty easy usually with cartridge cases because you're going to find that caliber typically as part of the head stamp. Not always, but it is pretty common. And so 25 auto is what you'd, uh, what you'd label it. The firing pin shape, we're concerned with that top view looking down. Uh, it's not as detailed a firing pin shape list as what a firearms examiner would work with, but we wanted to simplify it to make sure that it's easier on the user to put it in, put the data into the system and then let the system work harder to see what those actual patterns really are. So we classify these ones as circular, elliptical, rectangular, square, triangle, or unknown even. If you call it unknown, it's actually called unknown center fire in the drop list, but an unknown uh, exhibit or an unknown firing pin shape would search against all uh, possible shapes. The breech face patterns are also part of the class characteristics. Uh, we saw those breech faces uh, on the actual slides, so they're going to transfer that pattern across on the cartridge case when they're fired. Parallel, arches, concentric circles, cross-hatched, granular, smooth, just like we saw before. You can label these when you create an exhibit, but they are optional. You don't have to do it, but it can be helpful later on if you want to subclassify your correlation results, your search results on the IBIS machine. You could classify what you're seeing as part of your creation, but it's an optional step. And another part of the class characteristics would be to uh, make note of the ejector mark shape and the location of where it struck, but we are not worried about that for brass tracks. That's not part of what we cover uh, with the class characteristics going into IBIS. All right, so let's get into the fired bullets now. So to understand the markings that are on a fired bullet, we just got to go back a little bit first and talk about the manufacturing process. So for a conventionally rifled barrel, the first step you're going to do is take that rod and drill through it and make it a tube, essentially. So the drill doesn't quite look like this, but the first step is really to drill through the, uh, drill through the rod and make it a tube. And then the reaming is going to happen, which a precision tool goes through, makes it a very precise diameter, very straight as it goes along as well. And those reaming marks, whatever uh, marks are on the edge of these blades of the reamer, they are transferring a pattern during this process to that surface. Once that reaming is done and you've got the, the beginnings of a barrel here, the caliber it's ultimately going to fire 
would not fit down the barrel. The bore diameter at this stage is actually smaller than the diameter of the, bar of the cartridge it's going to ultimately fire, the bullet's going to fire. The next step would be to put the rifling into the barrel. And for conventionally rifled barrels, there's two different methods. There's cut rifling and button rifling. So for cut rifling, a gang brooch, which is a rod with a series of blades on it, uh, is going to be forced down the barrel, and those blades are going to shave off a little bit of metal to cut grooves into that barrel. So here's your barrel. Here's your gang brooch with blades. And each one of these blade clusters here is going to look like this from the front. So you could have four, five, six. The number count of how many there are could change. But each one of these, as it goes along, each cluster has got a series of blades here. And in sequence, each one is microscopically larger than the one that just went ahead of it. So this guy here is going to come in, and it's only responsible to shave a little bit of metal off. The next one does a bit more and a bit more and a bit more until the last one in the sequence, it actually has the diameter here across uh, equal to the caliber that it will be firing ultimately. So this last guy going through is shaving through that groove, and that's when it's going to be ready for the, uh, the caliber it's ultimately going to fire. Button rifling is kind of similar but different in its own way. Uh, there's a carbide button, which is stronger metal than the metal of the barrel, and as that's forced down that barrel, it is going to compress those grooves in there. It's, it's pushing the metal back rather than cutting the metal back. And so you could have four, five, six, some of these could even get into some real micro groove where you're up in the a dozen of them or, or even in the 20s or so. Uh, but typically in this scenario here, we've got six actual areas that are going to, as they get forced down the barrel, they're going to compress those grooves down the barrel. And the important thing to note here is that as each of these tools is being forced down, there is a gradual rate of twist that is being introduced at the same time. They are twisting down the barrel as they go, and they are going to go either right-hand twist or left-hand twist. It's up to the factory to decide. But they are uh, introducing these grooves with a rate of twist as they go down that barrel. Once that's been transferred over, you've got your rifling, which are the helical grooves in the bore of the firearm that are there to import rotary motion onto the projectile. So what happens is that rifled barrel... Uh, inside of it, you're going to have your land impression, which was not touched by the, the uh, gang brooch or the button. And you're going to have the grooves, which were. So this is either cut away from cut rifling or compressed away by uh, button rifling. And each one of these areas, when that bullet goes in, the diameter cross groove to groove is equal to the diameter of the caliber. It's an airtight fit. But where these lands are still present, that is still too tight. These lands are going to grip into the side of the bullet. And because there is a helical pattern to these, because there's a rate of twist there, as that's gripping into the bullet and the bullet's going down the barrel, that bullet has no choice but to start to turn with, those, uh, with that rate of twist, and it's going to continue to spin as it exits the muzzle of the barrel. And it's that spinning motion that the bullet has that's going to keep it stable as it flies through the air. That's what's so important about that rate of twist is that it's there to keep that bullet stable as it's going through flight. And as it leaves the barrel, when you're looking at that bullet afterwards, where that land was is going to leave you with a land engraved area or Lee as we call it, L-E-A, Lee. And where the grooves were is going to leave you with a groove engraved area. And that's where the markings have been transferred across, especially in this area here where it really dug in. The land engraved area is giving you the strongest marks typically. So if we take a closer look at that, here is one Lee. So just one of these areas here, we're close, we've got a close up zoom in on here. At the base, you've got the striations there, the scratch pattern that was left across the surface. And typically you get the best results of looking at that at the base of the bullet, especially when you've got a flat based bullet like this that is uh, jacketed material there, like copper jacketing over a lead bullet. That is gonna give you, the last two millimeters are really the area that we are most concerned about when you're doing work on a bullet tracks machine. On either side here of the land impression or land engraved area, you've got two shoulders. 
and that those shoulders are where you've got the height transition from the high G down to the low Li. And so the Li begins right at the bottom of that shoulder and continues to the bottom of this shoulder. So this area here, all the way across to this area here, with that being the shoulder itself, this lower area with the slightly dark, darker uh, color to it, that is your Li. That's the area we're most interested in with Ibis. Other areas, you've got a driving shoulder and you've got a trailing shoulder for each one of these. And whether, with, whether it's a driving shoulder or a training, trailing shoulder is decided by the direction of twist of the rifling. If it's a right twist uh, rifling, like this uh, picture is uh, showing an example of, from the base here, you can see that the angle of the stria is tilted towards the right. That indicates a right twist bullet. And so the right shoulder on a right twist bullet is your driving edge. This is the one that's going to have the cleanest, most defined cut to it. On the trailing edge, if that rifling is old or the gun's kind of worn, that trailing edge could get uh, could be a little less defined. And ultimately beside it, you could end up with some slippage where the rifling didn't grip as strongly on that trailing side. But the driving edge is going to be uh, the, the strong side that you want to be most cautious of and that's the angle of that driving shoulder should be the dominant angle of your striations on the surface of the bullet another thing to be aware of is that you could be seeing seating marks especially in the GEAs uh, if your G's have seating marks you need to be aware that you don't really care about these these didn't come from the barrel which is what the most important markings for us uh, came from the barrel these ones rather came from when the bullet was seated into the mouth of the cartridge case at the factory. As it was slid into that mouth, whatever imperfections were around that inner uh, circumference of the mouth were scratching across the side of the bullet. And that is not matching anything to the gun. That could be matched back to the mouth of the cartridge case, but that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in seeing what gun fired this. And that information is really at the base of the lees. There's also a type of rifling out there called polygonal. And when you're making a polygonally rifled barrel, uh, you start off with the same two steps. You drill through it, you ream it to a precise diameter dimension, straight. And then all of those reaming marks ultimately get polished out. And you get the extra step here of polishing out that barrel, which is actually kind of getting rid of what makes some of the most interesting marks in those lees. Uh, so that's polished out smooth. And another difference is that at this stage, the actual bore diameter is larger than the diameter of the bullet it's, it's ultimately going to fire. The next step is to take a mandrel, which is a pre-molded uh, or a molded uh, hard piece of metal that has uh, got the rifling pattern already molded into it. And that mandrel is inserted inside the barrel and ultimately hammer forged down and crushed essentially around the shape of that mandrel. Not necessarily with a hammer, literally, but it is uh, crushed around that uh, surface. And then the whole reason why the inside of the bore had been polished was because if all of that rough texture was still in there, after that hammer forging took place, that roughness would grip onto the mandrel. You'd never get it out. The fact that it's smooth means that you can slide that out. And once it is slid out, you end up with a polygonally rifled barrel. And that mandrel goes on to move to make the next uh, barrel, barrel in the uh, manufacturing sequence. The big difference here, though, is that there are no shoulders here. You will have, here's your single LEA for a polygonal rifled barrel. Everything, all the markings on polygonally rifled barrel or bullets uh, are quite a bit smoother. They're not as deep. They're not as defined. And that makes them quite a bit more difficult, both on IBIS as well as on the comparison microscope. For the experts, these things are even uh, a difficult thing to work with. Your striations will be there. They're going to be a lot uh, less deep. They're going to be quite faint. You do not have shoulders to work with. You don't have defined transition between the lands and the grooves. Instead, it's really almost like a little sort of rolling hill transition between one and the other. And that uh, they're tougher to work with, but there is something that can be done some of the times. You just got to put them in and, and hope for the best, really. You could come across seating lines here again, and those are from the cartridge case. They're not from the rifling, so seating lines should be ignored when you do come across them. 
Class characteristics for the bullets, they're called general rifling characteristics, and the GRCs can be broken down by the caliber itself. And the caliber you're going to measure here. With cartridge cases, it's easy. You get kind of a cheat sheet because you can look on the head of the cartridge, and more often than not, you're going to actually see the caliber stamped right there. With bullets, when you recover a bullet and you're working one, you don't always have that information available. If you've got just a bullet brought to the, uh, brought to the lab or brought to your police department from uh, the morgue or what have you, you don't necessarily know what caliber fired it. You've got to work off of the actual dimension of the, uh, of the bullet itself. So you can work imperial, you can work metric, uh, inches or millimeters, but you want to try to figure out what that bore diameter was by the bullet diameter. Number of Lees and Gs, direction of twist are also part of it. So if we look at the barrel and what that does to the bullet, you've got four here with a right hand twist, five with a right hand twist, six with a right hand twist, and you could even come across left hand twist there. In this case, six left is just happening in the opposite direction. And we can see that on the bullets that were fired through there. The more that you have, the more, uh, lees that you have or lands in the barrel that give you lees, land engraved areas, the more there are, the more narrow they're going to end up being. So when there's fewer, they're going to be a bit wider. So you got the big wide ones with the four right, they get a little narrower with the five, narrower again with the six with the right hand twist, left hand twist here. So the way to really get a sense of that twist, direction of twist is hold that bullet uh, or get the bullet in front of you. And from the base, just look to see which way that rifling cants towards. It cants towards the left, there you go, left hand twist. Cants towards the right, right hand twist. Lee and G widths would also be part of the general rifling characteristics, but we don't need to worry about that for bullet tracks because once that bullet's put in the machine and the acquisition takes place, the Lee width, the width of that land engraved area, is part of what's calculated automatically during the acquisition itself. So those are all the terms that you're going to need to be familiar with uh, for when your training starts. If you can go through this uh, presentation again, maybe a day or so before your IBIS instructor shows up, it'll give you an, a good foundation of the terminology you're going to be hearing a lot during that training session. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you have a great day. Thank you.